Hello, I'm Dr. Gloria Horsley, and I'm her daughter, Dr. Heidi Horsley. Heidi and I want to welcome you to Open to Hope Conversations, the podcast. We believe that the greatest gift you can give yourself after a loss is hope, using this moment to connect with others who have not only survived, but thrived. So let's get started. Welcome to the Open to Hope show. I'm your host, Dr. Gloria Horsley, with my daughter and co-host. Dr. Heidi Horsley. Well, Heidi, I know there's a lot of stress and anxiety uh, around children and grief, so we're going to have an excellent show today talking about reducing children's grief anxiety through play. So you want to introduce our guest, Heidi? Sure, I'd love to, Mom. Like you said, we're going to talk about reducing children's grief anxiety through play, and our guest today is Colleen Cherry. Colleen is no stranger to loss. She has lost, as a child, friends and went on to lose her parents, um, cousins, and other relatives. She's had many, many people in her her life die. Um, She today has a graduate degree in child life, is certified as a child life specialist, and she launched Play Well Child Life Services. And she was awarded the Clinical Practice Award in 2020 from the Association of Deaf Educators and Counselors, also known as ADAC. So welcome to the show, Colleen. Hi, thank you for having me. When I was in my undergrad, I got ushered into education and I knew that wasn't a good fit. My kindergarten teacher had the best descriptive of me, has difficulty staying within the lines. Mm -hmm. And to be a traditional teacher, you needed to follow those ABC kind of methods of teaching. Um, But during my undergrad, I found art therapy and had to volunteer. I found Buffalo Children's Hospital, started um, my 30 hour requirement for the semester and ended up with 120 hours. I found my home. It was a great mix between the medical interests that I had, um, a lot of one-on-one with the kids, and it also was imparting different kinds of methods of teaching. So it was a great mix for everything. Um, I stayed with Child Life at Buffalo Children's Hospital for four years, met my husband who kind of messed everything up and we moved to California from Buffalo. Um, There we ended up having our own kids and my pregnancies were difficult. So I stepped back um, from Child Life And as it turned out, I had three children, each of them with different and significant medical histories. So I was doing child life all throughout their lives without Mm -hmm. actually working in the hospital. But everybody knew from when my kids were very little, mom was going back to school. And I did so at the age of 52 and got my master's in child life. I love it. And I love that you said you were doing it with your own kids because I think that there's a place for parents out there to be able to learn how to do some of these things. My son had multiple ear infections, very significant, and uh, had multiple tubes put in. And one day when he was very little, he was in the hospital at five, very terrified. And what they did was the child life specialist came in, you'll appreciate this, and it got a little doll and pretended the doll was having the same surgery. And Alexander had to be, you know, teach the doll how to do it and how to draw blood and how to be there for him. And the doll was dressed up in hospital gear, the same kind of stuff that Alexander was, sat next to him. And Alexander, it really empowered my five-year-old. It empowered him. He was no longer fearful because he had to be strong for this doll next to him. And he had to show him how to do everything. And I was like, this is so amazing. I didn't know that child life specialists were in there empowering kids and helping kids and giving kids a sense of control over, over things like this. It was, it was amazing. Yeah. And my experiences with my own children Mm -hmm. are what led me to go out into private practice. Cause when I started, there were only about 10 or 15 people in private practice throughout the whole country in child life. Mm -hmm. And one of our projects was where do you think child life should be? That was a class project in my master's program. As a mom of three kids with significant medical histories, I knew exactly where I was going with that. We needed to be in pediatricians' offices. We needed to be in the community. And so when my professor and my advisor both saw my project, they're like, you need to do this. You really need to do this. And at that time, I didn't even know about private practice for child life. But 
I, I knew it was important. I knew the need was there. And I knew that that was something that I could definitely fulfill. And I have loved being in private practice because I can help kids like your son. Mm -hmm. um, our local children's hospital has, I think, a staff of 35 child life specialists. Wow. But yet one of the kids that I was working with didn't um, they didn't have child life in the department where he was going to have outpatient diagnostics right. or surgery. Yeah. So I had his parents and his doctor sign off on it. His doctor was thrilled that I was there because she knew child life and she knew she wasn't going to have child life typically. And it went amazingly well. Well, talk to us a little bit about the grief and loss world. I mean, what do children need after mm -hmm. a loss? What do families need after a loss? The biggest thing anyone can do with a child is understand their language. And a child's language is play. They understand things that are going on. They understand when things are intense, when their, their routines have changed. They understand when adults are upset. What they don't have is the vocabulary to share those ideas with the adults. So if you get down on the floor and play whatever the child is into. I've played um, Pokemon, Lego, I've played Paw Patrol, I've played tea parties, whatever the child is into, get down there and play with them. And you can gently nudge them into, oh, have you noticed that so-and-so's body has changed? Have you noticed that, you know, things are different in the house? address those things through the play. You don't have to force it. It can take a little bit of time. It's going to take multiple sessions, but get down there and play with the child. And you're going to get them expressing what they do know about what's going on, about their fears, about their questions. And they can do it through their play because they don't know how to come up to you and say, mom, dad, you know, I'm, I'm really concerned about the changes in the household and I'm feeling a little bit of anxiety. That's not gonna come out of a five-year-old. Yeah. You get down there and play, on, play with them and you're going to see what they know and what they understand. So that's why I came with the title, Play Well, because that's mm. what we're doing. We're playing yeah. to get these kids well. So tell me, how do I know if I should be concerned about a child mm -hmm. who's grieving? Any child who has experienced a death is going to need an outlet for grief. Um, we all know people that are important in our lives and what that whole feels like in our chest. And as adults, even in this country, we're still not great in dealing with it. Mm -hmm. um, but by sitting down with your child and helping them with some additional terms, um, you know, I noticed that you were kind of upset today, or I noticed you weren't playing as much today. You know, right now I'm sad because, you know, grandma died. I'm sad because this person is no longer here. Help them understand what death means. It's very specific to each developmental level. So three to five year olds, things aren't really permanent for them. So the fact that you're saying that this person's body has stopped working and they're not coming home, well, that's going to sit okay for about a week. And then they're going to come back and ask, mommy, when's daddy coming home? Mm -hmm. Mommy, when can we go see grandma? They're not of the developmental stage where they have that permanence. And any child is going to revisit their grief throughout their developmental changes. I've had families that I've been working with off and on for like three or four years, because initially we got the child to understand what grief is through play for the developmental stage they were in. Now they're facing another developmental stage and they're having questions. They don't really understand what happened at this level because nobody's given those, given them the vocabulary to go with it. So I come back and we call it tune-ups or a refresher. Um, different parents have different ways of, of um, titling it, but they'll contact me and say, you know what? My kid's been questioning things. 
um, we've had a subsequent death or they've heard of somebody else's death or with COVID, that has definitely played into every session I've done. Mm -hmm. Kids mm -hmm. are concerned, worried, have more questions. So the parents will bring me in for another session. We'll sit there and play for maybe one or two sessions, get that child up to speed to their developmental level. And I won't hear from them for a while. Well, well, and Colleen, I can understand if you've had a loss, how terrifying it would be with COVID. Children might be fearful that they're going to have another loss. And I imagine a lot of the play is that you're that you see what they understand and what maybe they don't understand and they're terrified of that they don't need to be terrified of, in other words. Correct. Yeah. And most of the time adults in their in trying to do their best, they're protecting their child. Mm -hmm. So they don't want to share these very big, very abstract concepts with their kids. And it doesn't matter if they're two years old or 20 years old. We are not comfortable about talking about death. Mm -hmm. And I always say that to parents, you have to be very clear with your terminology. Kids have wonderful imaginations. We mm -hmm. don't need to leave them into this big blank vacuous space and say, oh, so-and-so has died. Well, their little imaginations are gonna fill that space with every creative concept that they've ever seen on TV and stories um, from the news. They're going to make an amalgamation of all these little bits of information and it's gonna be scarier with what they have dreamt up in their minds than you sitting down and using factual terms and being very direct with them as to what has happened, why it has happened, how everybody is feeling, and giving them some coping techniques along with that information. I like that. Coping techniques are, are key. And I remember one time working with a child that had been told that his uncle had died peacefully in his sleep, and this child was now terrified to go to bed. Because yeah. he be believed that if you go to sleep, you're going to die. And so yeah. I love that you're, you know, giving them accurate information, having them tell you what they understand, and then giving them skills to cope. Yeah. Now give us some coping techniques. Yeah. Um, I have three that I usually um, impart on children in the very first session. Mm. These are three techniques. Love Oftentimes it. parents ask, should I stay or do you want me to leave when I'm working with their child? Mm -hmm. um, my whole idea is empowering the child. So that's number one. You have to come to where the child is. I don't have an office. I go to children's homes, medical facilities, churches, schools, wherever they need me to be. Mm -hmm. That is coming to the child. I am on their territory. I am empowering them. Mm -hmm. So one, you want to engage a child in art, in, in figure plays. You want to engage the child in something they're interested in. So that's a number one coping. You're not creating another level of anxiety and stress. You're coming to where that child is. So if they're in the room and I want to talk to them, I don't call them into somewhere else. I just go in and like sit this. down right. with them on the right. floor. It's like, hey, can I come and play with you? Or let you know, let's do this project. Or let's go for a walk. Something where the child is actively involved in the conversation. Number two, when you talk to a child, usually those 12 and under, they're not gonna sit still with their hands folded and parents feel it's disrespectful when their kids are up moving around and fidgeting with other things. That's a level of coping. That's mm -hmm. something the child knows how to do. They mm -hmm. can self-distract with other things while they're listening to what you say. So it's not disrespectful, it's not ignoring what you're saying. And I always warn parents, as your child is playing, they're listening and processing to what I have to say. You are gonna see evidence of what they've absorbed from this conversation in the next week or two in their play. They're going to be playing that more things are dying. They're going to be playing the different techniques that we talked about coping. They're going to integrate the information that they heard me say, even though they might not be sitting there staring at me face to face, they're still absorbing that information and they need something else to do to process. This is way too abstract, way too intense, and they don't want to make the parents feel bad. So they don't want to show their emotions as we talk about what has happened. Mm -hmm. So we're on their territory. They've got something to play with. 
and we start using direct terms. And for parents that are sitting in on the session, I look at them square in the face and I tell them, I'm going to be using direct terms. This is going to be more difficult for you to hear than it is for your child to understand. Your child needs very firm direct terms so that they aren't misunderstood, so that they aren't imagining other things. You give them that information and that helps them understand what's going on. Mm -hmm. So I have all different kinds of figures that we play with. I have sand trays we play with. Mm -hmm. I have little coffins that we play with. Uh -huh. um, all different kinds of materials that these child children are gonna get to play with and manipulate to figure out how this death fits into their life and yep. what death means. Like all of us, they are trying to gain mastery. Correct, correct. And that's the way they do it. Okay. They do it through play. That's yeah. their number one language. Babies, they st even infants. I've, I've dealt with um, young parents where one of the parents has died and um, people think, well, you're going to play. This is an infant. The infant can't play at this point, really. They don't really understand. They may not understand the concept of death. They may not understand that this person is no longer coming back. What they do understand is their primary caretakers are extremely stressed out. Mm -hmm. That tension, that anxiety is coming through that caretaker and that infant feels it. And they end up with sleep disorders. They end up with eating disruptions. There's different behaviors that come about. So I have worked with parents of infant children who have experienced a spousal or, or parental death. And it's, it's definitely there. Um, we approach it in a different way, again, at that child's developmental level. Mm -hmm. And that's where we need to go. So once we get on the floor and we're playing and I figure out what the child knows, um, a lot of times they don't want to say the word death or dying. And we have lots of different ways to play with that. I do... Um, Word searches, there's, there's a game we play with words. Um, going back to the, the simple things that I teach kids, one of the first things that we all do is end up with a tight chest and shortness of breath, right? When we're anxious, when we're, we're in a nervous situation, when we sense something's going on in our families, our breathing isn't as deep. So I teach bubble breathing. And even for the older kids, I'm like, okay. yeah, I know this is kind of silly for you, mm -hmm. but. I like to use the word bubble breathing and they start laughing. And I said, exactly, bubbles are fun, right? They make you feel right good. Yeah, yes, I've, I've really always really got fun. bubbles on me. I, I've been in a grocery store, kids were crying. I give mom a vial of bubbles. Um, but, <laughs> but the magic of bubbles is one, it is positive. Yeah. So it helps those stress levels in our brain start to, to shut down a little bit it controls our breathing. We have to breathe in big. We have to breathe out slowly and gently. That's getting that oxygen in. It's kicking out the cortisol in our muscles. We're starting to feel that relaxed feeling. So depending on how anxious a child is, I tell them three to five breaths or five to 10 breaths. Um, Bubbles are also a sense of control. We are in control of these bubbles. We can use these bubbles whenever we need to. Okay. We don't have to ask for permission. We don't have to go someplace special to get something. The bubbles are there. So we have given the child something fun that's relaxing, lessening yeah. cortisol. We've given the child a technique to control their breathing. Mm -hmm. We've given the child a distraction, something that is different from what's going on. We've given the child a sense of control. All this in a very simple little vial of bubbles. I love it. I, like I love that. it. Well, tell me how uh, people can get a hold of you and about Playwell and uh, do you do things online and yeah, work with families? I've always offered, I tend to be a light night owl, so I'm up late. Mm -hmm. And for teens especially, I've always offered them the opportunity to text or call me late at night. 
Um, I am in Southern California, so I'm on Pacific time. So other people in other areas, please be aware of that because I have gotten calls at 5.30 in the morning from other parts <laughs> of the country. Um, but I have a website, playwellchildlife.com. I have a Gmail account, playwellchildlife.gmail um, at gmail.com. Um, and that that's the best way to contact me. On my website, there's also a direct connection to, to my Gmail. But I've worked with kids as young as two, as old as 25. Um, I've helped parents in helping their child deal with what's going on. And everything is very specific to that child's developmental and age. Well, thank you, Colleen, for being on this show today and for all the wonderful work you're doing. It's uh, really important. Thank you so much. I feel very privileged to be a part of a family's event because this is, this is a big thing. Mm -hmm. And so to be there with them and to help them, I feel very blessed to be able to do so. Yes, I agree with my mom. Thank you so much for giving children a voice through their play. And thanks everybody for joining us on this show today. And Heidi and I always want to remind you that if you've lost hope, please lean on ours until you find your own and God bless. I'm Dr. Heidi Horsley. You have been listening to Open to Hope, the podcast. You can follow Open to Hope on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. To learn more, visit us at opentohope.com and go to Apple Podcasts to subscribe. I'm Dr. Gloria Horsley. Join us again next week for another Open to Hope conversation, where we invite you to lean on our hope until you find your own.